<clears throat> Hello everyone, uh, it's me Jonathan here to teach you guys about producer and some consumer surplus and the social benefit of the Wu-Tang Clan. This was my favorite lecture when I was taking intermediate micro with uh, Professor Clark and I'm very happy I get to teach it to you guys. I hope you like it. Let's get started. Two big concepts today, consumer surplus and producer surplus. Your consumer surplus. Remember when we were talking about getting a good deal on a good? Think of that again, or a new time you got a good deal on a good. Can you explain why it was a good deal without mentioning the price? Now think, how much would you have paid for that good? That's your willingness to pay. The dollar amount that you value the good. Say, um, I got, uh, I got this really nice basketball jersey, a LeBron James jersey, and I would have paid 50 bucks for it. But my friend was able to get me a deal, I got it for $30. My willingness to pay was $50 for the LeBron James jersey. How much did you pay for the good? Me, I paid $30. How much were you willing to pay? Me, $50. Subtract how much you were willing to pay by the amount you paid. So that's 50 minus 20. That difference is your individual consumer surplus for the good. This concept exists for buyers in the market. We, uh, exists for the buyers in the markets we look at. Different buyers have different willingnesses to pay and the sum of all individual willingnesses to pay is the total willingness to pay for all consumers in a market. Willingness to pay, we're gonna look at it graphically. A demand curve and a demand schedule is just a representation of the willingness to pay in the market. Over here, we got a nice little thing that I got from the textbook. Your consumer surplus from a single purchase is, di is the difference between your marginal benefit and the price or your willingness to pay. They're using marginal benefit, willingness to pay. Same thing. The total consumer surplus across all buyers is the area under the demand curve and above the price. Right here, we're looking at the B, the big area right here. This is the area of a triangle. Base times height divided by two. Over here, you can see here, C. Over here, they do the calculations. Um, and they find that the total consumer surplus for this little example is 7,000. Now we're gonna make our own producer consumer surplus with no numbers, no nothing, no textbook help. Just using the demand curve and willingness to pay. So over here we got price one, quantity one, right here. So this is our consumer surplus. If this is our first little price one, quantity one, this is how much consumer surplus we get as a whole in the market. Over here we make, and let's say we lower the price, therefore demand increases, quantity demand increases. So we fall from here down to here. We get even more surplus. For the surplus of additional customers, all of this, we get even more area for consumer surplus. Now, how would we maximize consumer surplus? Well, you can put it all the way down here. Maximize, make it the entire triangle. I'll explain a little bit why you can't do that, but it's because you have to think of consumers. And we're talking really quickly about auctions. An auction in general is a mechanism for allocating resources that requires buyers to disclose information about their willingness to pay. We can learn two things from an auction. One, the willingness to pay of the second place bidder or the first guy who, the last guy who stopped bidding against the eventual winner, the first loser. Two, the, lowing, the lowest possible willingness to pay for the winner. Once upon a time in Shaolin, in 2014, the Wu-Tang Clan auctioned off the only pressing of their new album. It became the most expensive album ever purchased. Martin Shkreli, infamous for exploiting the price inelasticity of demand for a drug called Daraprim, paid $2 million for the album. Cash rules everything around me. What are the two things we know from Martin Shkreli paying $2 million at the auction? Imagine instead the Wu-Tang sold their album for $15. We can do the math for the lowest estimate of Martin Shkreli's consumer surplus in this case. And what about another person who spends 10 minutes deciding whether to buy the album for $15 or not? How much consumer surplus would they have? 
Now you have to think about producers too. We can't maximize consumer surplus every single time. Producers, because producers are people too. And if we're interested in the well-being of society, we must include them. Now, corporations are not people, but they're owned and operated by people. Producer surplus, luckily, we're familiar with the idea of producer surplus. We usually just call it profit. Calculating profit, producer surplus or profit is equal to the price minus the marginal cost. I'll be showing an example in one second. Producer surplus is the area above the curve and below, I don't know why it says price, uh, below the price. Um, over here, calculating producer surplus. So we have producer surplus from a single sale is the difference between the price the seller receives and the marginal cost. That's A right here, the purple. This is another example from the textbook. Uh, the total producer surplus, surplus across all sellers is the area above the supply curve and below the price out to the quantity sold. So we're gonna be the big red area, B over here, that's our total producer surplus. C, this is another triangle. So again, we're just gonna do half times base times height, and they do it again here for our area B. They do 50 times, 50 minus 10 times 200, you get, you get 4,000. Now we're gonna look quick view of both together. You can look at it like this. You got consumer surplus and producer surplus on every graph. You can just do it like this, just looking at it. You do it again right here. They're not always gonna be equal. They're not always gonna be equal, but they both will always be on every, every time you plot an equilibrium, you can easily plot your consumer and producer surplus just by drawing some dotted lines out to the equilibrium point and the equilibrium quantity down. Um, Oh, that didn't change slides. We got one more view of both of them together just because I really wanted to make sure you guys saw it. It doesn't even need to be straight. They don't need it. Consumer producer surplus don't need to be equal. They don't need to be straight. They don't need to be anything. They just, they exist. It's just what they are. You do the math, you figure it out, you calculate it. They're not always equal. They're not always whatever. Yeah. Some quick caveats. Caveats. All right. <laughs> What is the relationship between willingness to pay and wealth? Obviously, if you have more money, you're probably willing to pay a lot more money for something that makes you happy. Who gains when companies are profitable? Economists also have developed other ideas of how the welfare of society can be measured, not to mention philosophers, sociologists, political scientists, and on and on and on. Plenty of people have had different ideas of welfare. This is just how we're doing it in this course. And most economists, yeah, is how we're doing it in this course and for most economics classes you'll be taking at Brandeis. Thank you so much. I uh, hope you have a great day. I hope you learned something. Um, I stopped recording.